And whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you all for being here. We are delighted to see you. This lecture series would never have taken off the ground had it not been for the support of two very important people, Dr. Yanis Yortsis, Dean, USC Viterbi School of Engineering, and Mr. Srinath Bhatni, the co-founder and director at Silla Ventures. Dean Yotsis has been coming to India every year since the inception of the series in 2016 and has and always delivers the welcome comments in person along with Mr. Bhatni. This year he will continue the tradition, albeit virtually. Uh, so I will first invite Dean Yotsis to say a few words. Well, thank you, Shuda, and a warm welcome to all of you. Um, I hope that uh, uh, you are able to see me uh, from this here. For some reason, my, my picture comes a little fuzzy. I hope that it doesn't, it's not fuzzy to you. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. It's a morning here in Los Angeles, and I know it's uh, evening in uh, uh, Bangalore, uh, but it's, uh, it's a great day for all of us. This is the fifth anniversary of the event. I am uh, very happy to be able to uh, continue participating in this, even remotely. I have said many times that uh, in this Zoom era, even though uh, the coronavirus era, even though we are physically separated, we are more connected than ever before. And I think this is another example of uh, this connection today uh, across the oceans, across, across the world, so to speak, and across time zones. Um, the series uh, has its um, origin back in 2016 when we realized that uh, in addition to all the ties that we have and the connections we have, it's also important to emphasize and uh, strengthen the connections in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship. <clears throat> and it is with great pleasure that we have seen the tremendous ecosystem of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship that develops in India and has developed for a long time actually. Uh, every year that, that I come to India at about this time of the year, I see uh, the developments that are going on in the country and in the technology ecosystem, as well as other areas as well. And uh, we are very happy to uh, provide some support to the extent that we can. This series um, uh, is uh, intended to strengthen those ties and also to highlight some of the most interesting uh, work that has been uh, going on. Today, we will highlight some of the work that is done at USC from people that have strong interest in uh, the work that's going on in India, particularly, and also potentially find in, in important applications as well. So um, without uh, having more, uh, more to say, I'd like to welcome my um, co-host to this uh, event, which is uh, Mr. Uh, Sinat Badne. Hopefully he's here. So back, yes. to, you. Uh, back to you, uh, Suda. Yeah. I see that Srinath is here as well. Um, Mr. Srinath Bhatni is the co-founder and director of Axela Ventures, and I'm, I invite him to say a few words and welcome. Thank you, Sudha. Thank you, Dean uh, Yanis. Welcome to everyone, depending on your time zone, either it's good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to this edition of Axela US, USC Viterbi uh, lecture series. Uh, we sort of conceptualized this uh, lecture series between Axelor and USC Viterbi School of Engineering a couple of years back <clears throat> when we met and realized that the innovation is going to be the key for the future. <clears throat> so we thought we will showcase some of our uh, portfolio companies as well as some of the work that is being done in USC through this lecture series for the benefit of all. That's how this concept was started. It has been uh, very popular every year. We do this uh, in December. It has been extremely popular with uh, all our uh, participants. As uh, we are all facing this unprecedented situation of COVID and uh, say goodbye to 2020 and look for 2021, <clears throat> one thing is very clear that technology is going to play a very key major role in our lives than ever. Thanks to technology as we speak, 
we are all able to get connected with each other so called meet each other virtually because of <clears throat> the technology platform we are all able to leverage upon if uh, technology had not come to the rescue uh, we could not have imagined what our situation or our life would be in the last 8 months so this technology while it plays a very key role it's also very important for all of us to realize that the innovation through technology is a key for our future so what we are doing through this platform is showcase some of these innovations some of them are extremely interesting and uh, which will impact as we see is important to understand and lot of work is being done in usc and in axelor we had uh, taken this responsibility of investing in very early stage ideas five years back today we have around 45 uh, companies in our portfolio who are all working on these very innovative ideas some of them will be will impact uh, the human kind itself while we are unable to meet physically like every year due to the situation we are in i also see a bit positive in uh, meeting this uh, meeting you know virtually in this through this meeting that is the number of participants who could participate has enormously increased because physically nobody need to travel to bangalore to be part of this lecture series they can access this from anywhere also we are able to get excellent speakers who are uh, working on very innovative ideas who are in different time zone who could take part because they could not have possibly come to bangalore just to take part in this uh, lecture series but today thanks to this technology thanks to the situation we are in we are able to access them and they are able to connect with us that's a very positive thing so which uh, without much ado i will uh, hand it over back to sudha but i have to mention one thing that without sudha this lecture series would not have come to this stage in last couple of years thanks to her for every effort and all the i know the trouble you take to connect with the various speakers and uh, convince them to come and talk to us uh, thanks a lot it has thanks. helped a lot and uh, quality of these lectures is uh, certainly increasing as years pass by thank you and hand you hand it over to you back sudha thank you so much srinath <clears throat> it's a pleasure Uh, we will now move on to the lectures um each lecture is about 20 minutes followed by 5 minutes of q and a uh, please save your questions to the end of each talk when the speakers will take your questions our first speaker is dr aryan uh, kabir <coughs> he and his team won the masi entrepreneurship prize uh, while at usc and went on to co-found a successful robotics company called Gray Matter Robotics which develops software for commercially available robots the application specific software from Gray Matter Robotics makes robots easy to use safe and efficient for complex operations in the manufacturing and service industries dr kabir will present on improving the quality of life with smart robotic assistants go ahead uh, kabir thank you very much for the introduction suza it's my pleasure to be here today uh are you able to see my screen just to confirm yes yes, yes we are perfect i'll start by showing this video and i'm pretty sure all the all the guests in the audience have seen something like this toyota or tesla using hundreds of robots to make cars it looks very fascinating at the same time i believe we have all come across news headlines like this robots are taking our jobs we are risking our livelihood due to robots and then this year covid happened and all of us has been forced to work from home and most of the activities that happens in the industries have slowed down as a result we started becoming concerned about our economics we started realizing that we need robots to actually survive as a as a society now if you look at these statistics 
you'll see there are only very few robots which are being used as of today. There are only two robots per 100 workers in the U.S. And that number is nowhere close to posing robots as a threat to take our jobs. On the other hand, that's nowhere close to the you know, adoption rate that we want for robots to help with our economy. And as a result, due to the slow adaptation of robots, people, humans, are still being forced to work on dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs. We spend enormous time and effort to work on this tedious and ergonomically challenging job. Now, I'd like you all to question yourselves. Can you imagine yourself spending eight to 10 hours a day, every day, working in this environment? Would you like your children to work in this environment? The answer is naturally no. Humans should not be working on this kind of operations. And humans do not want to work on, on this kind of operations. Let me give you an example of one of the manufacturer in Southern California. This manufacturer produces composite fiberglass parts for buses, trains, boats, amusement park rides, etc. And all of these parts need to be sanded twice before they can be painted. And he needs only three sanding technicians. This is a small business. He needs three sanding technicians to run his operation. However, last year, he had to hire 12 sanding technicians because as soon as he hires and trains someone for this operation, they work for a few weeks and then they quit because people simply do not want to work on this kind of operation. And this is not just in Southern California. This labor churn and skill shortage is putting the U.S. economy at a big risk. To, to find a solution, we naturally think about having tools or machines that can help and complement humans to work on the tasks that's physically impossible to do for humans, which are very challenging to do, or humans simply do not want to do. And naturally, we think about robots. Why aren't robots doing this? Now, if you remember the first video that I just showed you, let's take a deeper look into it. What happens in the industry as of today for at least for robot manipulators or robot hands, there are people who hard codes this, manually programs them, and it takes months or year to create a robotic cell that can be then used by Tesla or Toyota. And these robots, they keep on repeating the same hard coded motion over and over again, and they keep on doing it blindly. So as a result, if I am to summarize the characteristic, what happens, the challenges, uh, the challenges are that today's robots, they're dangerous because they're repeating blindly some pre-programmed motion, and hence, they need to be put in cages. They're, they cannot, we cannot really afford to have any human walk near them because they are you know, repeating the same thing on their own. And as I mentioned, it takes months or years to program and create robotic cells. The reason is it's very difficult. All of us are comfortable in using iPhone or smart gadgets, right? And the picture in the middle that you're seeing, this big calculator-like device, clunky device, that's how you program robot using this device. You press numbers, put in some register values, et cetera, to create or to make the robot move in a, in a, uh, in a desired way. And also, today's robots, as, as I was mentioning, they're kind of blindly following the pre-programmed motion. And they are not really concerned about the environment around them. And therefore, sooner or later, mistakes happen. They damage something. And we, we simply cannot use these kind of technologies to, you know, uh, to automate the task that has variability. Hard-coded automation cannot be used for variability in geometry or the material or the lot size. Maybe I'm producing five parts today. Tomorrow I'm going to be working on different kind of 12 parts. This technology is not scalable for rapid, uh, rapid change. What we truly need are smart robotic assistants. And at Gray Matter Robotics, we believe these are the five traits of smart robotic assistants. They need to be able to program themselves, learn from observations, operate safely without damaging them, hurting themselves or anyone around them. And most importantly, 
we want robots, we need robots to be able to efficiently interact with humans and ask for help to humans if they're stuck. Robots should not stay stuck. And to become smart, robots need brains. And that's what we do at Gray Matter Robotics. We make brains for robots. And the way we do it is by developing physics aware artificial intelligence algorithms for robots. If I have to very quickly summarize the core features of our robo brain, our robo brain allows the robot to see and think on its own. It allows the robot to act efficiently and safely and also react to make sure it's meeting the right quality as well as safety when the environment is adapting. Now, our robot brain is a software. The way it works is the software can be combined with commercially available robots, sensors, and tools, and we put in some intuitive UI for specific application to create smart robotic cells that then can be used like an appliance by the end user or manufacturers or some other industry. Now, let me take a step back and give you uh, a broader picture of different kinds of applications that a robot or we people with our hands can do and want robot hands to do. So there are actually two broad classes of applications. One is material handling application. These are all the pick, pack, and ship kind of operations. And then on the other hand, there are process applications. You're using some heavy tool. You're making some value added change to the surface of an object. Processes like sanding, finishing, painting, welding, etc. Now, we are a very young company, and we decided that we should not be the 351st company working on material handling, and therefore, we decided to focus on process applications. And what we create are application-specific software suite. Think about Adobe. In the back end, Adobe may have similar technologies for Photoshop or Premiere, the two different softwares for video editing and photo editing, right? But on the front end, their UI is configured and geared towards the ease of use of that specific target user. We are taking a similar approach in our software suite. The software front end for sanding application is slightly different from spraying application, making sure that the shop floor operator is comfortable in using it. Let me give you an example how our software works in action. So the video on the top, that's showing you how robots are programmed as of today. Jackson is comfortable in moving the robot by hand because this is a collaborative robot. You can't really touch industrial robots like this. But as you see, he's teaching a lot of points manually to you know, train the robot to polish the surface. This is a windscreen of a fighter jet. And after Jackson is done teaching these points, if the part moves or the next part is slightly different in geometry or the part fixture changes, he has to go through the same painful process of teaching the program again. And therefore, that method is not scalable. On the other hand, in the bottom video, as you saw, our robot saw the part with a camera, with a uh, RGBD camera, 3D camera, and basically figured out what to do and started doing it. So I'll quickly go through a few other examples of our software in action. As you see, this is a, the same scan and send solution working with a collaborative robot on a seventh axis on the left and working with an industrial robot on the right. And both these robots, they are able to, you know, uh, take our take the advantage of our hardware agnostic software and be able to program themselves on the fly. And it can call for help when the sandpaper change is needed. It just sent a text message to the human operator. <clears throat> and the same software can be used for multiple robots to work in a, in a synchronous manner. Here is an example of two robots working on a really large part uh, from two different sides at the same time. And not just sanding, as I was mentioning, uh, you can use it for different applications. So this is an example of a polishing of that windscreen. 
uh, it's a it's a windscreen of a fighter jet. And if you if you if you ask me, uh, this is this part seems to be small, but even this part, it takes about fifteen or sixteen different passes of polishing with different sandpaper. And for a human to do, it takes something between four hours to six hours for every single part. And it's a highly repetitive process. So why not let robots do it? And you know, some of our engineers, one of our engineers actually, Caesar, he was like, hey, uh, we can polish fighter jet screen. How about I just pull in my car? So one fine night, he pulled in his car and put the robot on a you know, mobile base. And as you see, Gelling put a tape around it because he, he thought, hey, let's not polish the, uh, the glass, the window. Let's just polish the body. So robot could figure out, okay, this is where I should work on and started working on it. And basically the advantage of, you know, uh, having robots on mobile bases is that they can now move around off your shop floor and then go on different sections and uh, keep on working. This is another example of uh, a similar surface finishing application, but this is spraying. Spraying is very useful for, let's say, dispensing adhesive, uh, spraying fiberglass, painting, coating, etc. And again, the way people do it as of today uh, for high mix or high variability application is completely manually. They keep wearing this protective equipment all day long, sweating in 80 to 100 degree Fahrenheit, and then operating this heavy equipment, just taking back and forth, back and forth. And uh, with a similar uh, software solution, we can let the robot work on spraying applications as well. Now, to, to summarize, uh, the approach we are taking is we are trying to, we are creating this software to convert robots into appliances for specific applications. And I believe that's, that's where the you know, beauty of technology is creating simple solutions that are elegant, that is very easy to use. And with technologies that can enable simplicity and ease of use, that can transition the shop floor workers of yesterday into decision makers of today. And that's how we can start improving the quality of life and quality of work. With that, uh, I'd like to end my talk. Thank you everyone for, your, uh, for being here today and I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Aryan. That was very interesting and the number of applications that this can have are just mind boggling. <clears throat> so it's really amazing. Uh, so uh, if anybody has any questions, you can uh, type them up in the Q and A. Uh, I had, I put a question in the chat box. Uh, okay. Um, so why don't you just go ahead and ask that also, Srinath? <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Arin, for that wonderful uh, exposure of this new world. My question is about uh, looking at our COVID situation today. How far is the technology to have robots who can, uh, which can manage this uh, isolation wards, wherein uh, even the doctors and nurses need not enter? but uh, patients are stationed, like doing any other routine work, like changing their sheets, uh, supplying the medication, as well as taking the temperature, vitals, readings, and those kind of things. Sure, there are actually a few companies who are working on uh, supplying the medicines to the patients in the, let's say at the hospital wards, taking the temperature, et cetera. So there are some solutions for mobile robots, which are actually available as of today for uh, this kind of uh, supply operations or simple temperature taking operations. But for changing the bed sheet, that's a little bit more involved process. And the technology, there are two, two challenges to actually have that. There's a technology challenge, uh, being able to you know, use robots to actually do it in a, in a uh, deterministic way every time without making a mistake. And then there is an economic, economics to it. So you can put a lot of different sensors and a lot of machine to do that routine operation. It's basically that trade-off between the you know, right use of technology versus whether you know, the economics are gonna work out or not uh, for that operation. So in that context, I think the way 
I am seeing the world moving forward is basically it's accepting technologies in places where the economics is making sense immediately, and then uh, waiting for some of these other applications uh, to pick up automation as the hardware cost is coming down. Thank you. Okay, we have another question from um, um, Ajay, who says, if sanitizing the whole ward of a hospital using robot is possible, why are we not doing it? No, that's a very good question. And actually, there are, there are a few hospitals who are actually doing it. And especially this year after COVID, uh, there has been a lot of different, you know, robots, mobile robots that has come out, which are basically uh, either spraying some disinfecting fluid or moving around in the hospital or office or hotels or schools with UV lights to disinfect the visible area. And actually, uh, gray matter robotics is also working on a, on a similar solution. So think about having a mobile robot, which is just you know, spraying the disinfectant or just taking a, you know, roaming around with a UV light. The light or the spray can only reach so far. There's always some, let's say, occluded region where if you just have the light moving around, it may not reach. And that's where robot arms can also play a big role because the arms can now take that disinfectant to some really, you know, uh, uh, occluded area like, you know, the inside of your drawer, or it can open the door of a closet and disinfect, or some nooks and crannies where normally the light tower at the back of the robot may not reach. So we are actually developing a prototype right now for Lockheed Martin to take the same technologies and let the robot arm on a mobile base disinfect the last 10 miles. Okay. So, uh, Mohammed has a, a very interesting question. We know that bugs can always occur in software. To what extent can you be sure that software can implement the desired accuracy? Right. It's a very good question. It's a very practical uh, problem. And the answer to that is you have to keep on testing. You have to keep on testing. You have to keep on understanding what are the corner cases, what are the edge cases. And you can never be so sure. So you, the practice that we follow, we listen to our customers, we constantly take feedback, we create logs, and we analyze them routinely to understand whether there was any mistake, if there was a mistake, what was it you know, due to, and then basically release patch to uh, fix those mistakes. Now, there are certain mistakes that we have to, we have to make sure never happens something, let's say, that can destroy something or damage something, right? That becomes scary, and that also causes a lot of trouble. It can, you know, be very risky for humans to be around robots. So those kind of, or those kind of mistakes, we take a conservative approach and sort of, you know, not let the robot do 100% of the task, maybe limit itself to do 90% or 95%, and, you know, let the human do rest 5 or 10% just from the concerns of safety. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Aryan. That was a very, very interesting talk. We will now move on to our second speaker. Uh, Parag, you can go ahead and set up your uh, uh, presentation. Okay. So I, in the meanwhile, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Parag. Our next speaker, Dr. Parag Havaldar, an Academy Award-winning computer scientist experienced in software technologies for a variety of digital entertainment initiatives that involve 3D, computer graphics, computer vision, and imaging, machine learning, media compression, streaming, and distribution. Currently, Dr. Havaldar manages the R&D efforts at Blizzard Entertainment to advance cinematic technologies for prominent award-winning games, including the world of Warcraft, Overwatch, Starcraft, Diablo, Hearthstone. He also serves as adjunct faculty member of computer science at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. Dr. Havaldar will present on realistic virtual digital actors, where we are and what to expect. Uh, we're very looking forward to it, Parag. Please go ahead. Thank you, Sudha, for the introduction. And Hello, friends. I was just going through the uh, names of participants, and I found a few familiar names. So if you have been 
part of my course. Uh, uh, welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Um, what I want to talk about today is entertainment. You know, in these COVID times, how do you, uh, when you're stuck at home, one of the main things to entertain yourself is we watch movies and games. And USC has been a big home to me. Uh, I graduated from USC and since then have been working in the entertainment industry, also teaching at USC, but also, but as part of my professional careers, career, I've also taken part and really uh, joined forces with the research uh, going on at USC to see how it can be brought into entertainment. So um, what I wanted to talk to you about is part of the technologies that have been developed in the entertainment industry for realistic uh, digital actors and virtual actors. And um, these technologies have been used in a variety of movies, which you see out here, whether they've been animated characters at the bottom, as you see out here, or uh, realistic looking uh, photorealistic characters that you see uh, in, in some of the movies on the top. Uh, currently, I'm also working on similar cinematic technologies uh, for gaming uh, purposes, which are more real time. Uh, and you can see some of the uh, uh, franchises that these technologies are now making their way into, such as the World of, War World of Warcraft, Diablo, Overwatch, and Blizzard. So to begin with, let me show you a simple demo reel. Hey, M.A. Yeah, eggs? Organic, got it. pause it there because this goes on for some time. Um, this is part of the technologies developed at Sony Pictures when I was uh, working there. And <clears throat> you want to talk about virtual actors, but let's talk about how it all began with real actors. So I'm going to give you, show you two photographs of real actors. One of them is more famous than the other. And if I asked you who it was, you probably all talk to, uh, um, uh, speak to Charlie Chaplin on the right. Uh, but people often uh, don't know who the person on the left is. Uh, and um, he, here's the story. The person on the right is one of the most famous uh, artists of the 20th century, Charlie Chaplin. And the person on the left is, is William Dunlap, who was one of the most famous artists of the 19th century. But we don't know of him. We know of Charlie Chaplin, and that's because of Charlie Chaplin's timing, not timing in comedy, but timing of his career, which seemed to have um, come about at the time when uh, one of the most important inventions of the 20th century, the motion pictures camera was, was, was invented. And with that invention, he could take his projections or his, uh, uh, his movies and project them across time and space. And that's how we know him. Uh, but there are two important points of view that I'd like to, uh, or unique perspectives that I wanted to share about this story. One is that um, the motion pictures camera, when it was invented, it's been used, it, it was used in a certain way. Uh, you know, it was just plopped in front of uh, uh, the screen, uh, in front of the th uh, theater, 
uh, and where, where Charlie Chaplin was acting and it was, and you captured it. It's taken another hundred years of cinematic evolution by technologies and visionaries uh, that, ha that, that, now, that, that, that has developed in a way we use the, ca the camera today to tell our, uh, our stories. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, you know, mediums are changing. Uh, so if you think about uh, um, uh, uh, the new mediums of today, which are um, uh, you know, virtual reality, maybe holography in the future, these are the uh, ways that are gonna be prevalent in the future. In the past, William Dunlap, who was the most, you know, he was no, he's the father of, uh, of, of American theater uh, or re regarded as a, by historians as a father of American theater. He wasn't there during the time of capture of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, of, of uh, when motion pictures happen and thereby he has been forgotten in a similar manner as technologies evolve and you're not part of uh, the medium of today, uh, let's say holography. It's possible that you know, Charlie Chaplin will also die out and will not be known to your great grandchildren. Um, but throughout this, uh, in, through these inventions such as these, the marriage of technology and the arts has started uh, to happen. And you found that technology influences the arts and arts influences the technologies and this goes on uh, uh, and, is, and has been going on for some time. Um, so um, when it comes to uh, stories, most of the uh, uh, the most important uh, part of a story is characters, and they're the center of all emotional experiences, whether it's a narrative experience or whether it's an interactive experience. Um, and faces are one of the most important things that uh, that, that actors use uh, when they play these characters to communicate emotions. Uh, faces are very important. Uh, I mean, it's, it's evening for you uh, folks, for some of you folks, and uh, uh, I can tell you that throughout the day, you probably have seen your face at least five to 10 times in the mirror to make sure that it's good enough uh, to present because faces are the way we communicate. Uh, there, there have been, uh, there's, there's been a lot of research done with faces where, um, you know, from, from a, from a biological perspective, we know what the muscle, the muscle structure and how it, how it plays out. But from a neurological perspective, there, is, there are dedicated areas in the brain that are used for understanding faces. Um, and uh, actors are going digital today. Uh, it's no secret that you know, most of the high grossing movies and storytelling and games that are coming out have digital characters with digital faces. And, while faces are are good for communic are needed for communication, making digital faces is very hard. Uh, I remember one of the first movies that came out, which was Lord of the Rings, uh, about twenty years ago. And in this movie, there was a digital character called Gollum, which held screen time for a long time. And it was uh, movies like this that suddenly, you know, people. And directors started to discover that, you know, maybe this, the the presence of digital characters in movies is really going to be something revolutionary. But making digital faces is extremely hard. One of the most challenging problems of computer graphics and uh, cartoony faces are one kind of uh, uh, challenge. But as you go more and more towards realistic faces, these challenges become highly hard, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a challenging problem, uh, you know, research-wise, has been a challenging problem research-wise, and also, although it's possible and it's done, uh, and it's, uh, uh, and it's, and you use digital faces and digital characters and quite a few movies today, this is not at scale. It's still an expensive process. Um, so this has been used in a variety of movies now, you know, every digital character has a digital face and a digital body. And they've been used in a stylized manner uh, uh, and also in a more realistic manner. Uh, when we were <clears throat> approached by uh, directors uh, that wanted to make this at, uh, in, in a bunch of movies, 
and to have it done in a very programmatic manner, not in a you know hand animated manner, which is a which is a very expensive proposition. Uh, we our answer to that was developing something we called performance capture technologies back then. And to give you an example, uh, here is a scene from a movie called Monster House, and what you'll see is actors acting out a uh, a shot or a, 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 a skit out here and. There are virtual cameras. There are cameras capturing, you know, the, their their performances, and this is programmatically then transferred onto the digital characters that you see uh, in this situation. Yes, um, are you nuts? I don't want to steal drugs from my father. I don't want to go inside a monster, and I don't want to die. I say it's worth a shot. Yes, I agree. Let's do it. So, in performance capture, we take an actor's acting uh, as a director by director and capture it using you know bunch of cameras and then translate that from a digital from from a uh, um, uh, acting standpoint and transfer that onto a digital uh, character in body and face uh, here are some of the technologies that were invented for movies uh, such as beowulf and avatar A bunch of actors acting has been directed, and you'll see that all these uh, markers are being captured by lots of cameras, reconstructed in three dimensions, and then used for uh, retargeting to create animated digital actors. And the closer you get to realism, the harder it becomes to to you know capture the timing of the acting and 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 get it rendered in a photorealistic manner. Um, so how does this all work programmatically? Uh, driving a digital face was a was a big problem by about you know ten years ago, and uh, we to invent a few technologies. We talked to a bunch of people. They were you know, makeup artists uh, in Hollywood, which made digital face, which made face prosthetics. There were uh, people in the medical field, there were behavioral scientists. And the theory we came or we honed down on was using the facial action coding system, which was invented by a well-known psychologist called Paul Aikman. And uh, what he pro propounded was, if you look at a digital face, if you look at a face, the face of lots of muscles, the muscles in this area, they behave in a certain way to create action units. And these action units uh, are very specific and can be measured. And what he did was uh, for the first time was uh, go over all the muscles of the face and figure out what are the main action units and there are upwards of 40 action units that the face produces for creating emotions. And he also gave a way of, 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 of measuring, given any kind of expression, how do you break it down into a combination of these action units? Right. But uh, when you look at something like this from an engineering standpoint, and you see a regression, and uh, then it becomes easy to replace some measured action units and see how this can be set up in a mathematical way to get any human expression expressed in that, in that manner. Uh, so what happens next is you take actors into a calibration studio or calibration stage, and you capture all these action units uh, uh, and um, get their three-dimensional representations. And when they're acting, you could then uh, take all their expressions in time and break it down into one of these expressions and see how they can be applied digitally uh, to, to characters. So here's an example. Just wait, the wily may roam. And, 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 and by that time, we combined uh, forces with, uh, with, with the research that was going on at Institute of Creative Technology at USC, and we were able to use their light stage technologies to, to, to capture realistic skin and realistic uh, 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 lighting conditions. And 
be able to duplicate that to an almost real looking digital face. Anything to help out my friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Uh, this is used on Spider-Man and then uh, on, on, uh, on Watchmen and then a bunch of other movies. Um, here is an example where we tried to do this in a very creative manner for Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland, uh, where his objective was to have cartoony faces, cartoony looking uh, caricatures, uh, uh, the Tweedles, but their faces had to be realistic. And so some of the technologies that we developed were using you know, uh, tracking features on the face and then projecting digital rigs that could then uh, highlight what was going on. Uh, and here is it's what's the take or a take looks like in a movie where you see that the central part of the face is an actual photographic plate where the rest of it is all virtual. Here are some of the examples of digital characters that have been created using this technology. So given all that, what's trending today? <clears throat> so you can see that all those pre-rendered cinematics that you saw, given that now we have uh, high-end computer graphics hardware and graphical processing units, GPUs, you can make these things go in real time. And that's, what hap that's what's happening in games. We have real-time game engines, uh, like the Unreal Engine or the uh, uh, or you know, some of the technologies that we're developing at, at Blizzard, where now you could get real-time characters uh, performing in virtual environments, uh, like in games. And given the deep learning advancements uh, uh, that have been going on, you could try and create any kind of digital face to drive it. Uh, so for instance, uh, let me stop sharing my screen. And give you a example of a real-time demo. And this was actually created by uh, some of the students in my class. So if you want it, you could become a virtual character. I mean, a, a digital face of, uh, in this case, is, uh, if you recognize it, it's um, um, Robert Downey Jr. And the point to make out here is um, these are all still mimicked, right? It's it's a digital face. It's it's a real face driving a digital face. Uh, but there's also research going on that in, in 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 places where you want to be able to activate this face. So it's not copying. It's like a computational activation. Uh, and when this starts happening, uh, then things get interesting because. Uh, uh, for instance, in games, we have cast animations that get activated in response to what a user or a player does. But if you think about it, uh, if this activation is not based on cast animations, but based off of um, you know, some high, high level database, for instance, you go and today it's very natural for us to record all our um, uh, you know, all, all our uh, uh, information on, on social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, where we have our likes, our dislikes, and our personalities somehow digitally embodied in there. And if you could bring out all that information and use that to, you know, animate a face, then, then you could see that some interesting things like, uh, the, because those databases live on, right? So you could have yourself captured, recorded, kept and and activated uh, in the future such that you know you might have you might live beyond your your years so your great grandchildren could actually talk to you and get responses from you uh, 
although you're no longer here. And that is in a way, some kind of digital immortality. So uh, in the future, you, know, the, you will see uh, interesting things and applications uh, coming out of that. So with that, I'll end my talk and welcome questions. Okay, thank you, Parag. I think um, your talk was just so interesting and I'm sure the audience would want it to continue on and on, but, uh, but we are short of time. So um, we do have a question um, and that is how does face tuning and the rest of the makeup cam AI based work? So uh, if I understand your question correctly, face tuning as in you want to tune your face to make sure that it expresses correctly uh, this is uh, you know it depends on the signal that you're capturing uh, so if your signals are accurate you could use them to 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 drive a digital face but then supposing if you wanted to if you smile in a certain manner and you want to amplify that smile you could tune your face to make sure that when you smile by X percent, you actually amplify it by Y percent on your, on a digital character. Um, I okay. see. So Arun has, uh, Arun Chidambram, I think one of your students uh, and an alum. Um, how far are we away from human photorealism, eyes, etc., in real time rendering? So it's happening as we speak. If it's if it's pre-rendered, uh, we can already we can already do that. Uh, in real time, there are lots of applications happening where uh, photorealism is, is 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 coming. So it is happening right now, uh, and I think uh, give it another three four years, and you should be able to see applications using machine learning that will be able to generate you know realistic looking faces and eyes that. Uh, that you can really interact with. Okay, we'll take, I think, one last question. And that is from Pranav. How does filters and AR emoji in Instagram and chats and Snapchat work? So it's similar technologies in Snapchat. Uh, the, you know, you can detect a face very easily today. You can find out, you know, the features of the face. You can, you know, using machine learning techniques, track features of the face and though you can, and then you can project uh, 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 things that stick on the face and move around. Uh, there's some computer vision camera projection uh, uh, requirements there. And uh, those, are, those are not uh, hard to do. Um, uh, but what's what's hard is really getting the realism. Uh, you know, if you wanted to create some other kind of, uh, if you wanted to become a different digital personality, that is hard. Uh, but 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 in the near future, you'll see you know aspects of that also you know, coming to light. Very good. Thank you so much, Parag. We all enjoyed the talk very much. Um, there are a few comments for you um, which are in the chat, so maybe you can uh, respond to them offline. Uh, we will now move on to our third speaker, and that is uh, Professor Barok Koshnevis. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Countercrafting Corporation and the Louise L. Dunn Distinguished Professor of Engineering at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. He holds over 100 patents worldwide and is a fellow of the National Academy of Engineers uh, also the National Academy of Inventors, uh, apart from um, a whole bunch of other honors that are just too long to mention. Um, Dr. Koshnevis will present on construction scale 3D printing, past, present, and future. Thank you very much, Sudha. Uh, can, can I be here? Yes, we can hear you. You can share your screen um, if you're ready. You're right. I've tried to show my, I mean, uh, turn on my video, but apparently there's a problem. It's not showing me. So, sorry. Yeah, but uh, I can share the screen and uh, go right to my slides. All right. Uh, is my slides being seen? Yes, we can see them better. Very good. Uh, okay. Um, 
so I'm going to talk about a technology uh, basically that I started uh, about 25 years ago. My first patent on this goes back to 1996. So I started working on it in 1994, and uh, now it is becoming a construction uh, industry, a new construction industry. Um, well, the principle here is the use of 3D printing at large scale. Um, for those of you who don't know what 3D printing is, it's basically a method of building objects uh, in an additive way without molds. Historically, we've been working on three different uh, fabrication technologies. The uh, subtractive ones, where you start with the block and remove unwanted parts. This is highly automated since about 1950s. Numerical control, computer numerical control machines. There's uh, millions of them in different uh, manufacturing facilities and uh, research laboratories. Uh, the problem with this is that uh, they cannot uh, really create very complex geometries. Uh, the tool cannot reach the inner cavities of complex parts. Another issue with them is that they uh, provide, uh, create a lot of uh, chips uh, that become waste. Uh, additive processes, conventional additive processes, uh, basically use molds and you pour in the either molten metal or the uh, or molten plastic, you inject into it uh, the mold and then you separate the mold. Uh, it's very nice approaches, are uh, very good for mass production. Problem with them is that uh, molds are pretty expensive and uh, uh, once you have a particular mold, uh, then the, the change in design is very difficult, very expensive. You have to alter the mold. While um, in uh, reality, every product goes through alteration. Uh, constant improvement always happens, especially in the early age of the products. And with the rapidly moving industries today, uh, uh, the product is not produced for a long time. It's constantly uh, updated new models and so on. Model T Ford uh, car for 15 years was produced the same way. You do not find any car today that doesn't change from one year to another. And finally, the formative processes. Uh, typically use sheet metal uh, for like uh, applications such as furniture, car bodies, and so on. So the focus is on additive. The desire to build additively uh, without mold has been around. The same way that um, a human sculptor builds uh, objects, 3D objects, very intricate 3D objects uh, in the middle of the air without any uh, molds. Uh, it is very hard for that to be done by robots. Uh, it, uh, Human sculpting uses uh, amazing uh, dexterity of human hands as well as uh, very powerful human mind. So uh, about 30 years ago, someone came up with the idea of building objects in a layer-wise fashion, pretty much the same way that you decorate a cake, the icing on the cake. Uh, you put the material layer by layer. So instead of dealing with a three-dimensional problem, which is complex, you deal with fabricating much simpler two-dimensional objects. And by stacking them, you come up with three-dimensional objects. Well, this gives you a lot of advantages besides not needing them all. Um, the advantage being uh, what you have not yet built is not on your way. Therefore, you can create all kinds of intricate internal features for the parts. There are several methods now in the market. Some of them uh, are based on extrusion of filaments, the cheaper ones, uh, plastic filaments, uh, then powder processing, and, and so on. And the material range started with polymers, but now uh, metals are becoming uh, pretty popular, uh, pretty common. Uh, 
more complex machines and processes, but uh, uh, the utility is more serious for metals. And uh, ceramic parts as well are uh, being uh, treated uh, using 3D printing. So application range from uh, toys, architectural model, jewelry, uh, more serious applications in real functional parts, as I mentioned, and in medical, uh, biomedical applications, uh, in dentistry, uh, making uh, prosthesis and uh, for, for orthodontcy, like uh, uh, Invisalign is very uh, popular these days. Uh, for surgery, uh, through CAT scan, you can build actually uh, you can find the model of uh, organ that you're about to operate on and then you can 3D print it and the doctor can uh, examine this uh, from different dimensions. It's a much better uh, visibility into uh, the organ where uh, a surgery uh, is supposed to take place. I have been working in this technology is a field uh, for a long time. Uh, this is a family of uh, uh, meso scale, uh, average scale, basically uh, fabrication technologies are called SIS, selective inhibition, shaping uh, or centering. And uh, the technology is capable of building uh, polymeric as well as metallic parts. Um, so the past of this technology, the large scale 3D printing technology started with uh, me thinking really in 1994 uh, about the fact that uh, 3D printing builds layer by layer and uh, the only structures, uh, objects that people have been building throughout the history in a layer-wise fashion are actually buildings. Uh, so uh, this is 3D printing today. Uh, this is a building that was 3D printed 2,500 years ago. It's in the southern city of Bam in Iran. It's made entirely with clay and straw. It's Adobe uh, Fortress and it's still standing. Okay, so, um, it became uh, kind of a conviction for me that uh, really the true and most impactful application of 3D printing maybe is not in manufacturing, but is in construction because it is already proven. The method is already proven by manual approach. All we have to do now is to bring the tools of digital age uh, to this problem and uh, the vision was basically building a robotic system uh, that uh, automatically extrudes uh, construction material, primarily cementitious space material, uh, such as uh, conventional concrete with some alterations uh, for curing rate and uh, slump and other characteristics of concrete. But the idea uh, was to build uh, these machines that could be taken to the site, quickly set up, and uh, buildings could be printed one after the other. Um, presumably every uh, design being different than the other one because it's very easy to change the program and, and create a different structure. So I named the uh, invention that I made the uh, contour crafting. Contour crafting basically builds with much thicker layer and yet can maintain the smooth surfaces. And this is uh, by the use of a, a trowel, basically a planar, metallic planar surface that is adjacent to the orifice of the nozzle as the material comes out. This computer controlled uh, uh, trowel basically uh, adopts the shape and uh, smooths out the other surface of extrusion. So uh, back then I built a number of uh, structures out of uh, various materials, including uh, clay and, and uh, eventually I decided to try concrete. 
concrete was much harder because it is not like a creamy material like clay, but it has a lot of uh, granular uh, contents such as sand and, and gravel. It is very hard to extrude such a uh, composite. So my effort uh, has been on development of different ways of delivering this material to a moving nozzle and delivering way, uh, the, the, the very different ways of uh, extruding them. Uh, and uh, it has been quite a journey, a lot of uh, difficult problems that uh, eventually solved. And I um, started building larger machines and making demonstrations. Uh, this was around 2004 and uh, uh, the Publicity became all of a sudden very significant for this technology. You know, the, all the major media, New York Times, LA Times, Spiegel, and so on internationally covered my work. And then uh, that uh, added to my enthusiasm uh, to even work more seriously on the technology. So uh, these uh, videos show some of our early work. Uh, and uh, the different scales of the machine, different uh, shapes of the nozzle, uh, different kinds of materials that we have tried over the years. And my vision has been total automation of building construction. Uh, I included uh, automatic assembly of reinforcement element, plumbing elements, and even uh, electrical network elements. Uh, to complete the building. Throughout the years, uh, we've done a lot of innovations, including embedding of uh, wireless sensors uh, uh, and uh, uh, coils and uh, steel, uh, stainless steel fiber and so on uh, to just investigate and demonstrate the possibilities. Uh, yeah, this was uh, one of the early uh, specimens that we built. And this is only 10 hours after fabrication. It's a concrete that has got uh, microfibers in it um, to add to its tensile strength and prevent micro cracks in curing. So uh, concrete typically reaches its uh, maximum uh, strength in about 28 days. And uh, I told you this is 10 hours after fabrication, so it's not really uh, in its maximum strength state. Uh, it's only four layers, uh, about 10 centimeters, and we flipped it 90 degrees. This chart was published uh, in uh, Amsterdam uh, uh, in uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and it shows uh, the activities right now that are going on. And as you see, I started this uh, at least 10 years earlier than others. Uh, and our uh, activities basically uh, include now plans uh, for uh, a number of uh, new directions, which includes even um, uh, application in space. Uh, okay, so currently, uh, we know that construction needs change. Construction is the biggest sector of every economy almost, but uh, it is handled in the most antiquated way. It's really the only thing we still build by hand are these buildings. And uh, uh, it's a dangerous job. Uh, it kills a lot of people annually. About 60,000 people die on construction sites and many other reasons why we need to uh, automate. Uh, the number of homeless people or people who live in substandard conditions is too many. Uh, there's a lot of need uh, for houses, according to United Nations, at least 800 million houses are needed. Two billion people are homeless. Three, uh, about 40 million people are uprooted every year due to natural disaster and war. Uh, yeah, 
condition of slums and uh, natural disaster and refugees. Uh, there are a lot of refugees caused by senseless wars that are going on all the time. Uh, so our plan is to build a variety of structures, build, be able to build a variety of structures. Uh, we focus on machinery, developing machines, uh, and um, not getting into construction really. Uh, but these are the kinds of uh, artifacts that we are after uh, developing machines for. And uh, all the software aspects that go with it. Uh, including simulation prior to actual building. We have made some demonstration constructions uh, uh, in here and in our branch in China. Uh, so started the company in 2017 called Contour Crafting Corporation and we have a, our first branch in China. Uh, my former doctoral student is uh, handling that uh, activity there. Uh, yeah, this was a huge sign, totally printed by our machine, and uh, for the city of uh, Shaoxin uh, and in, in China. It's at the entrance to the city, basically. It's entirely concrete. And uh, different kinds of uh, hard escaping uh, objects that could be materialized. So about the future, um, there are, like any other uh, disruptive technology, there are barriers against this technology as well. Uh, construction is a conservative industry and it's got a low profit margin, it's typically based on bidding. Uh, there are regulatory obstacles, you know, it's not just that uh, you can build a building and have people live in it uh, with any method, with any material you have to pass the building code standards. It's just like the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, it's people's lives uh, that are at stake. Uh, and that's, that could be a pretty complex process, especially, for example, now we are trying to get uh, uh, certification uh, in Los Angeles area, which is uh, part of California is highly seismically active. So the codes here are pretty stringent um, and very difficult to pass. There are other applications of the technology. We have been working with uh, Siemens, a German uh, company to consider building tall wind turbine towers using this technology. And uh, we have done some basic preliminary studies and uh, uh, it's a very promising approach. Um, it can cut the cost of the towers to almost one half of what it is right now. Currently the tower is the most expensive part of uh, uh, wind turbine installation. And another uh, activity that we have had has been in space uh, related uh, research. Um, Space offers a lot of possibilities for humanity. And uh, one uh, way to get to it is to capitalize on the two planets that are closest uh, to us, the Moon and Mars. And uh, we have done some basic research in conjunction with uh, some NASA grants uh, on uh, development of uh, technologies to be able to build on Moon and Mars. There are these days companies that are investing actually in the space uh, exploitation and uh, different companies for different purposes. Uh, our project uh, was first uh, to consider uh, how to build uh, without water. You know, there is water both on the Moon and Mars uh, but it's a form of permafrost and very hard to get, but even if you get it and melt that ice, uh, especially in case of the moon, uh, the absolute vacuum steals that water from you, you immediately evaporates. So you cannot make hydraulic concrete. So we've been looking at other ways of uh, 
uh, building, including melting uh, the regulated soil, uh, the sand uh, on uh, these planets and extruding them. And, uh, is uh, basically showing it's very noisy so uh, it's basically show, it was showing uh, the sulfur concrete uh, extrusion that uh, we came up with especially for martian applications these are some specimens that we printed and uh, could have applications or like hangers or landers and other equipment to uh, protect them from radiation and micrometeorites and stuff like that. Uh, and for building roads and things, uh, uh, other infrastructure elements, uh, shade walls, uh, uh, the last protection wall at the landing site and so on. Yeah, this is a kind of a, um, our vision of how it could be it's mobile robotics, uh, the rover that moves the robot is made by JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, it's, it's a six-legged six rover. One of the legs here has been used to scoop the material and put it in the hopper. Okay, so we won a, a NASA competition grand prize in 2014 for the adaptation of contour crafting for space applications. The next project was building landing pads using uh, interlocking uh, high temperature ceramic tiles and we developed another 3D printing technology called SSS, Selective Separation Shaping. Uh, and uh, we demonstrated that with a simple rover in place, we can build uh, uh, landing pads. Landing pads are needed because without them, the uh, landers uh, could tip over if they land over soft uh, soil uh, dust. Uh, if the bedrock is not horizontal, uh, the lander could easily tip over. So now in the future, landers are going to be much heavier and we need landers that are more protected. So this other technology is again a large scale 3D printing technology. Here, um, combination of uh, extrusion of powder uh, or deposition of powder uh, with a high temperature ceramic and microwave is used to center the tiles in place. And other applications of the same technology for hydraulic concrete have been tested. We won another NASA grand prize another international competition in 2016 for uh, the invention of SSS. Yeah, uh, in a space fabrication is another uh, important thing that uh, is going to happen in future. <clears throat> in the space, you have the free energy of the sun. You have the pristine environment of space, uh, free of dust and uh, uh, absolute vacuum, which is excellent for especially electronics, um, VLSI chips, and so on. <coughs> uh, these uh, conditions of the space uh, is really favorable to manufacturing, and if you can uh, exploit the materials of the asteroids, especially, uh, you can get everything uh, you want. Uh, and I think that's going to happen in the future. Uh, yeah, so we built, um, we adopted the technology for landing pad uh, later on for building metallic parts. And, and this approach can work without powder layering. Therefore, it is good for microgravity. It can build uh, in space, inside the space station, stuff like that. It works with powder material. So I said in 2017, uh, we started the Contour Crafting uh, Corporation under the investment of Omdash Group, uh, which is a, a multinational uh, Austrian company. Uh, they build um, uh, panels, self-rising panels for creating high rises. The tallest buildings in the world typically uh, are built using their technology. 
uh, contour crafting company is in uh, El Segundo city in LA County, Los Angeles County. We are about uh, seven minutes uh, from uh, Los Angeles uh, International Airport. Uh, and since we started, we have got uh, several contracts uh, from the government and we're working on also newer contracts uh, right now. And hopefully uh, shortly we will release our machinery for uh, uh, construction market. Thank you for your attention. That was a fantastic talk, um, Barok. We really enjoyed that. Um, you do have several questions. Um, Mohammad asks, um, this technology performed layer by layer, so it is uh, possible that the sheer stress between the layers will cause separation and thus break the piece. Has testing been done on the printed parts to meet the existing strength for different industries? Okay, um, yeah, this is typically the first question people ask about this. Uh, um, it is really not an issue. Uh, uh, experimentally, we have found out. And of course, uh, there are things that uh, uh, impact this interlayer adhesion. Uh, let's just think about uh, brick construction. In brick construction, you lay dry bricks on wet mortar. And yet the strength is very good. A lot of brick buildings that are demolished, you see the, the cracks uh, in places that go right through the bricks rather than the interface. Um, that interface is pretty strong. Now in our case, we put wet concrete, not dry brick, wet concrete on top of wet concrete. Of course, the fusion is much, much stronger than the fusion between mortar and dry brick. Okay, so um, if you don't have worries about brick laying, you shouldn't have worries about our process. Okay, another question. When does the 3D printing of buildings hit the critical mass of building 20% of all buildings built? Well, uh, what percentage, Suda? 20%. 20%. Well, it's going to be a while, <laughs> I tell you that. Uh, the reality is that, aside from all the excitement and the hype, competition with conventional construction is very difficult, economically especially, right? Aside from all the regulations that you have to pass and all that. Uh, for a lot of construction kinds, like small homes or whatever, typically small construction companies, ma and pa companies, uh, do the job. There are 38,000 uh, such companies in the United States. Uh, I bet there are many, many uh, around the world uh, similarly. So, uh, these companies basically have no asset. They don't even have a place. They don't necessarily have an office, uh, maybe a home office. I have a friend actually who does this and I know him. He doesn't have an office. He just has a home office. Of course. He doesn't have any employees. So whenever he gets a contract, he calls the people he knows and assembles a team and goes at the thing. And after it's done, he just, let everybody go, meaning that he doesn't have to pay for any machinery. He doesn't have to pay for any space to store the machinery. He uses inexpensive workforce. Yeah, technology is going to reduce the number of workers there, but you need at least a couple of more expensive workers there. Of course, they're gonna be there for a much shorter time. 
if you use the technology. So the main advantage is really cutting down the cost of manpower. But your construction is done, you're still liable for that machine. You have to keep it somewhere. You have to pay its mortgage. You have to maintain it. These are the issues that those other companies that don't have any technology don't have. And that's, that's basically one part of it. Another part is that conventional construction is super flexible and they can do everything. Here, 3D printing just builds a shell of the building. The shell of the building, the value is between maybe 15 to 25% of the whole value of the building. There's still a lot of other things that have to be done. Uh, this is assuming that you don't do uh, these other activities that I talked about, such as automated reinforcement, uh, plumbing, electrical. Uh, my vision is to do all of those, but we haven't done it yet. And uh, they come in the stages. Yeah, if we are able to do that, of course, uh, we will have a better uh, prospect. Uh, but just building a shell of the building, uh, don't expect this to take over uh, the construction industry anytime soon. Okay. So um, one final question. I'm actually going to combine two questions that have come here. Um, what kind of material is used to 3D print organs and what is the future of 3D printed organs? Okay, so 3D printing organs, um, this is not my field actually. So uh, I, I know as much as uh, uh, ordinary uh, enthusiasts know about them. Uh, the materials typically have to be organic uh, and uh, a lot of the interesting parts are that uh, scaffolding uh, for the organ is printed and then live cells are placed in them and condition of growth for the cells are created uh, to live in them and, and, and gradually create a, a, a functional organ. Um, for skins and other things, um, there are other materials, hydroxyapatite or whatever, uh, that have been simpler, more successful so far. So I'm not really into uh, those fields. That's the extent of what I know. Uh, uh, but as far as biomedical application, I have a lot of experience in dental part of it, you know, dental prosthesis and all that. And orthodontics, I have developed systems for those. And those are uh, pretty uh, dominant now. 3D printing is, is getting very dominant, especially in orthodontics. Thank you so much, Barak. We, uh, I mean, the space applications, all of it sounds very exciting. And I know that in case of uh, floods or earthquakes, I right. think uh, the uh, the opportunities for people to get very quick housing um, is very exciting. So we've actually come to the end of our talks. And uh, what I would like to do is invite Mr. Ganapati Venugopal, the co-founder and CEO of Axela Ventures to give uh, the closing remarks. Thanks, uh, Sudha. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it is, it is so strange uh, that last December when we uh, had an event and we all uh, uh, met in person, um, we could never have anticipated a situation like this. Uh, but, but thanks to uh, human enterprise that it is really possible for us to continue the series uh, without an interruption. I mean, we all know that we live in unprecedented uh, crisis and unprecedented times. But I do think that it is also a time of hope and optimism, right? I look at how quickly we have been able to first adapt and then uh, respond. Uh, I, at Axela, work with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and I've seen how most of them have really bounced back. 
at USC, uh, like many other educational institutions, what would have been unthinkable in terms of the entire education moving online has happened uh, just in a matter of two quarters. At work, uh, from work uh, only at office to work from home, now uh, we are open to the possibility of working from anywhere. And uh, least of all, uh, we have at least a dozen vaccine candidates, uh, you know, which would have been just unthinkable. It has been done in one tenth the time of any previous uh, attempt to create a vaccine, which is such a great example of uh, how, I mean, this is possibly the largest, uh, you know, global cooperation effort uh, to, to bring to bear the benefits of science and technology. Uh, to the betterment of uh, humans. And as Srinath said in the opening, we have come to realize uh, how powerful technology can be rather than treating it as a villain and uh, how, how it can really uh, serve us. Sitting through the presentations today, I could clearly see the glimpses of uh, future and uh, which will prepare us for a better world, whether it is Aryan's work in robotics, uh, whether it is uh, Parag's work in animation, and uh, recently Barack's work in uh, something as archaic as uh, construction and how uh, you know, the same technology could uh, help us build bricks and the same technology could possibly help us explore space, right? And that in some sense is the essence and whole purpose of this uh, lecture series, getting the audience a glimpse of uh, the future from scientists, from innovators, from entrepreneurs uh, uh, who are in the process of creating it, right? So uh, let me just conclude with a uh, vote of thanks. Uh, thanks to Ardian, Parag and Barok uh, for making their work accessible and uh, giving the audience a glimpse of the future uh, as it is being built through each one of your work today. Uh, thanks a lot to Dean Yatsos for wholeheartedly supporting the series. And uh, thanks to Sudha, uh, when it would have been easily uh, possible for us to postpone this uh, series, uh, you know, just making sure that we don't really break the tradition of getting the series going uh, just before uh, the year end. And uh, thanks to the audience uh, for supporting this and, um, and uh, uh, being there. Uh, patiently listening and uh, hopefully you've, you've had a lot to think about and most importantly uh, have had some glimpses of uh, what the future is likely to be. I know we are uh, hitting the end of the year uh, so thank you once again for joining us uh, in this uh, wonderful lecture series today and uh, wish you all a very happy Christmas and uh, safe, uh, happy, um, hopeful year ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful comments, uh, Ganapati. So um, we come to the end. We've um, heard the three wonderful speakers. Thank you once again. I know all of you come in from the US and it's very early morning and it is a challenge, uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, but uh, Aryan, Parag, and especially Baruch, um, <clears throat> So thank you to the audience for joining in today. Um, good night for those who are in India and I'll have a wonderful day for the folks uh, joining from the US. I really want to especially thank Maita Schuster who's been, um, who's in our Dean's office and who has been um, helping out in the background in a very, very uh, competent manner. So thank you Maita, I really appreciate all your help. And stay safe, everybody, and uh, take care. And wish you a very happy 2021.